Welcome to Insight, today produced in partnership with KCOS 13 El Paso Public Television. Today we are chatting with El Velarde, Executive Director of Paso del Norte Children's Development Center. Al has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Al, for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me to the show. So your organization serves a whole range of children with, with different developmental disabilities. First, let's talk about that challenge. What type of development disabil developmental disabilities do these children have? Well, we're going to serve any child that has any disability, uh, any, any disability that, that causes a delay in their normal function. So we're talking about anything uh, which is behavioral based, such as autism. Uh, we take care of children with ADHD. We have children with physical disabilities, uh, hearing impairments, visual impairments. So any kind of disability that a child can have, that child can be a candidate for services that we provide. And the challenge there is that so many different competencies are required to provide adequate support to these children. When you're talking about a child with ADHD or a child with autism or a child who perhaps has a physical disability or has a hearing impairment, you're talking about children with fundamentally different needs. How do you actually address all those needs in a way that is, that is sustainable? Well, we do, and, and we have different uh, therapies that we're going to be delivering to a, a child who has a special need. So we can uh, deliver speech therapy, for example, for any child that have, have, may have a delay in speech, may have a, uh, swallowing issues. We have uh, physical therapy, and we have occupational therapy. Uh, we have our early childhood intervention program, which is going to work with children ages newborn through three years of age. And then we have our pediatric uh, therapy services, which takes over from the ECI program and takes care of children then from three years plus. And then we have our applied behavioral analysis program, which focuses just on, on children who have autism. And so between all of the different programs that we have and models of therapy, uh, we have uh, every opportunity to be able to take care of a child that comes in with any kind of special need. And when you're taking care of the child, you're not just taking care of the child, you're taking care of the family as well. How do you engage the family in this process? Actually, that's a very important part of the picture. Uh, you know, the child with a disability obviously needs to cope, be able to cope with their disability, uh, but the parent has to be able to cope with a child with a disability. And when a parent has a child uh, that has a special need of some form, it's extremely stressful. It can be very expensive. And, and all of this coming together uh, makes it very difficult often for a family. And so what we want to make sure is that we have services available not only to, to serve the child, but also programs that help the parents as well. So, for example, we have uh, our CRC program, uh, Community Resource uh, Program. We're able to provide supportive services to parents. So we have a sib and, and siblings, actually. So we have a sibling program, for example, that works with siblings of children with special need to help them understand their brothers and sisters special condition. We have a parent training academy where we're able to bring together uh, parents who have their children with special needs and they come together as, as a group and they, um, they're able to talk with each other and learn from each other. We have a program under the CRC program uh, which is funded by the state of Texas that helps us train parents to become advocates for children with special needs, which means that these very parents can go and fight for their children at, at different legislative or, or community governmental organizations to ensure that, they, that we're able to continue to provide service as we move forward. So we have a plethora of services available that helps a parent. And then on top of that, we also have an inclusive child care uh, program at our facility where we're able to take care of children uh, not only the child with special needs, but a child that doesn't have disabilities. And very popular program in, in El Paso, a lot of parents are utilizing it. But all of it is really the purpose is to help support the child, but to support the child, we have to support the family. Really, the, the organization that you're creating has so many different aspects to it. Talk about how you got into this particular field because there's, there's no training for, for this kind of complexity. How did you end up in, in the position that you're in where you're trying to manage the complexity that you are? 
Well, I got to admit, I kind of just fell into it. <laughs> there was no uh, long-term planning for me. To so what was your this work. what was your career arc? Well, uh, you know, I, my first career is I was a police officer here in the city of El Paso, and I retired from the El Paso Police Force about uh, I guess it's been about fourteen years now. And how many? How, how long did you serve? Uh, Twenty-one years. So you got to know the community very intimately from a law enforcement perspective. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, when you're a police officer, you, you know, you're working in the streets, you're, you're dealing with issues and problems that people have at the point that they occur. And our responsibility in law enforcement is to be able to go in there and be able to mitigate that. The end goal is always to preserve peace at that point in time with that situation. And so it's, it's, you know, reactive many times at situation. Obviously, we want to be proactive at that point. Um, but this is what we do as police officers in the streets. We're preserving peace. What have you learned from your staff now coming into this less familiar environment mm -hmm. where you, you're running an organization, but there are experts who have been doing this for a long time and they have knowledge that you don't? What have you learned? Well, and what I've learned, and I've learned this a long time ago, that um, my strength is that of a leader. I'm not the therapist. I am not the the case manager. You're not I'm the not, subject matter I'm expert. I'm not on the ground floor doing the work, and and so what really I think has resonated with my staff is that from day one that I walked in the door, I said, "You're the expert. You know your job. My responsibility to you is to listen to what you need and to help bring forth the resources that you need for you to get your job done." So you're you're trying to make their job as easy as it can possibly be with an environment that allows them to execute their expertise. Absolutely. And, and because I'm not the therapist. And, and I will say that uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity for the first time uh, to go out with one of our therapists with our ECI program. And we do the therapies in, in the family home mm -hmm. uh, when we do those therapies with ECI. And that was the first time I had an opportunity to go see what it is they were doing. And, and number one, I was just truly amazed with the work that was happening and how our therapists work with a child. Uh, number two, I sat and I watched, and, and I, I just to be able to see the therapy taking place, I learned more in that half a day that I spent with that one therapist than probably the entire time that I've been an administrator with this program doing what I already know. And so that was extremely valuable to me. I think my staff is very happy uh, that I'm opening myself up to that, that I'm learning from them, because that is what it, it's about. It's not about them learning from me. It's about me learning from my staff. Talk about the scale of the organization, your physical facilities, and, and okay. your infrastructure. Well, our organization has 100 and, uh, approximately 120 staff members. And how many people do you serve annually? It, throughout all of the different programs, over 6,000. Over 6,000. So you have 120, did you say? Uh -huh. 120 Six, and 6,000 6, people 6, served people annually. Through different programs. And... Um, uh, the majority of the staff that we have are therapists. We have a large therapy staff. And then followed behind that are going to be our social workers and case managers. And then uh, through a child care program, we have our child care attendants. Uh, that's the only area where we have part-time staff. And, and so that's part-time uh, and full-time staff who take care of the children. And then otherwise, it's just people who are there to help those experts do their job. The administrators are, are right. uh, front office or billers or billing team or uh, accounting team, so forth and so on. So it, it's a, a fairly large organization for, for a small nonprofit, shall I say, and uh, a, a lot of work that has to go into it in order to be able to see the end outcomes that we're looking for. But I'm very proud that we, we operate really very efficiently. What is your funding stream like? We have uh, varied funding. Uh, we have grant funding that's supportive of our therapy programs. Uh, our primary payer is going to be Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, as a nonprofit, our mission really is to serve the low-income families. So right. uh, we, we really reach out to low-income families who do not have access to, to the therapies in the private world, uh, in private practice. Um, but we do take, take a payer mix as well, so we accept private insurance for those therapies. We do have funding that will help pay uh, the parent responsibilities for those families that just can't do it. So if, if a family just does not have the means to be able to, even $5 to be able to pay, um, we have grant funding that helps support scholarships in that, in that manner. Um, 
And then we are, so, so we're paid Medicaid. We have some private insurance. We don't do a lot of it because again, that's not our role. Our role really is Medicaid and, and low income. Um, we do have our ABA program, for example, in Texas. Unfortunately, Texas Medicaid does not cover ABA services. Right. So it is, it is paid for by a grant from the Department of Health and, and, and Human Services. And so the state doesn't, doesn't fund these services, but uh, the feds do. The, the feds do. To a certain extent. The feds do, but under Texas, under Texas Medicaid, ABA is not. Okay. So we do not build to Medicaid for ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis Services. And right. this is for the service of the children. And it, and it really is a shame because ABA is really coming out as one of the, the, the it, it's being said it's one of the best models that you can provide to a child for therapy. And in, in Texas, uh, the best we can do is offer the, uh, I'd want to say it, the low end version of ABA, which is uh, more of a part-time version because truth be said, ABA is a full-time model. It can right. be a school. And, um, but unfortunately, even at the state level with grants, they're not supporting that level of therapy. Uh, we certainly would like to see that happen. And hopefully one day it will. Will the shifts in uh, Medicaid that are prospectively coming and the shifts in, in federal funding, will that significantly affect you? And how do you prepare for, for you know, if, if those effects are, are negative, how do you prepare for that? We were hit with a 25% cut in the ECI program in January of last year. And then we've also, at the same time, were hit with the, with the Medicaid cuts. Uh, when they cut back with Medicaid, what they're doing is they're rewriting the rules, basically, in how you qualify somebody to be eligible. And right. So they, so, so they it narrow it, narrow exactly. it, narrow it. So that result means fewer children will be able to meet the qualifications to receive funding for the program. Our role is to recognize, and, and the planning that we're doing is, is our agency has not had to do a lot of fundraising in the past. I today have a job announcement out for a fund development officer because we're going to have to significantly increase the ability to raise our own local dollars uh, in order to be able to meet the needs of our local community. The last thing that we want to see happen is that we have to cut back the number of kids that we serve. And the return on investment is a child who is happier, a family that is happier, a community that works better together, a, a um, society that is taking care of its own. Avalarde, thank you so much for sharing the work of Paso del Norte Children's Development Center, and thank you so much for your insights. Mark, thank you so much for inviting me.